First Corinthians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, we'll start with these verses this morning. And uh, they are verses both that talk about the importance of the cross. First Corinthians chapter 12 uh, and verse number 18. But the preaching of the cross is to them that there is foolishness. But in us which are saved is the power of God. And then Hebrews chapter 12 uh, and verse number 2. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Before the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's follow our hearts on a word of prayer. God and Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking to your word and studying together this morning as we do so. We pray that things said and done are in glory of the name of Christ and be edifying to the saints. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as I said, we've been talking about the cross the past several weeks and talking specifically about the things that Jesus Christ says on the cross. And we've, we've seen a lot of detail about that. We've seen that Jesus Christ, really for the time he was on the cross, doesn't say a whole lot. There are seven statements reported that he, he's made from the cross. Um, he was on the cross for about six, out of six to seven hours. Um, it's, it's more than six, but less than nine. We know that. And since seven is the number of perfection, uh, we would say, well, let's say he was on there for seven hours. Um, to perfectly fulfill the Father's will and perfectly fulfill uh, the Father's plan. And so this morning, uh, we want to look at the last three statements that he made of the cross. And you know, these verses that talk about the cross and the importance of the cross, um, it, it, you know, I always, uh, you know, when I listen to other preachers and, and things like that, uh, it's, it's amazing how things always come back to the cross, even people that maybe don't have an understanding that we have of Paul's ministry, but it all comes back to the cross. Uh, I heard this little guy yesterday, and he said, you know, the thing about the cross is, it's the one time that God's will and Satan's will were perfectly aligned. Satan wanted Jesus Christ to die on that cross, and God wanted Jesus Christ to die on that cross. Now, for very different reasons. Satan thought he was defeating God when Jesus Christ died on that cross. He thought he was defeating his enemy. He thought he was defeating the, the one that was God's anointed. God wanted Jesus Christ to die on that cross because he knew that's where the victory was. He knew that's where the sacrifice for sins was. He knew that was going to be the basis that he could reconcile with heaven and the earth. So they had very different reasons for wanting Jesus Christ to die. But at that point, at that time on the cross, the, the will of God and the will of Satan are in perfect line. We want Jesus Christ to die on that cross. Um, and obviously, the, the reasons that God had for wanting to die prevailed because Satan killed him thinking that was going to win the victory, but it didn't. Um, God uh, allowed him to be crucified. He gave his life knowing that it would provide redemption and payment for sin. And in fact, it did. So um, it's interesting that, you know, when you focus on the cross and, and the importance of the cross, and that was just another little piece of the puzzle that, you know, at that point in history, at that time, um, the will of God and the will of Satan aligned in that Jesus Christ must be God. And that death, of course, becomes the means of our salvation and our redemption. So we've looked at what Jesus Christ said on the cross. Let's go back to the book of John, chapter 19. We, we, there are three statements in the beginning, and those three statements in the beginning deal with instructing Israel, uh, here's what's happening, here's what you have to do. Now that you've crucified the Messiah, what are you going to do? Um, he takes the, the statement of one malefactor there when he says, remember when you defend your kingdom, and he uses that to instruct Israel, here's what you have to do. First, he prays, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, uh, and, and that gives them an opportunity to, um, to have a, another chance. Even though they crucified the Messiah, even though they have done this terrible, wicked deed, it gives them another chance. Um, and those three statements tell them what they need to do uh, in order to take advantage of that chance. When he says to the thief, uh, today we will be in paradise, that's based on the confession that the thief makes. And that profession that the thief makes is exactly what Israel has to do. They have to humble themselves, they have to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, they have to repent of their sins, and the thief does all that on the cross. Therefore, today we will be in paradise. And then finally, um, he says, to John be told by mother, and to Mary be told by son. And he gives John over to the care, I'm sorry, Mary over to the care of John, but also, by extension, he's giving the nation over to the care of the apostles. The chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, they are the ones that have crucified him. So
So now, what should that nation do? Well, they don't follow those chief priests anymore. They now follow the apostles. And as he gives Mary over the care of John, he's giving the nation that little flock over to the care of his apostles. Then last week we looked at the middle statement. Um, uh, well, when he says, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabah, and I, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We spent a lot of time last week just talking about how that is the, the critical, that's the hinge point of all of history. That's the time when Jesus Christ is made to be sin for us. And being made to be sin for us, um, when he dies, that sin that he dies for is not his, but it's ours. And that when he dies for our sin, he provides a way that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So that, that middle statement, that center statement is critical uh, in understanding all that God did on the cross, and right? understanding all that Jesus Christ suffered on the cross, and understanding how all of us can have the righteousness of God because he took our sin on him there on the cross. So today, we wanted to look at, oh, and wanted to think about that, when he began his statements, he said, Father, forgive them. By the time we get to that point, he says, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? The relationship that he had with God as Father and Son is broken in that middle statement. And God is still God, but he no longer has that Father-Son relationship with Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ has been made to be sin. And God can have no fellowship with sin. So the relationship is broken. He refers to him as God. We're going to see today, in the last statement that he makes, he goes back to referring to him as Father. We'll see that in just a few minutes. Right now, John chapter 19. Um, so the last three statements come in pretty quick succession. Um, John chapter 19. So it appears like on the cross that there are statements made and then there'll be time of, of quiet. And then there'll be that middle statement is made, then a time of quiet again, and then these last three statements are made. They kind of fit together that way. And in John chapter 19, verse number 28, um, the shortest of his statements from the cross, John 19, 28, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. So he, he says, I thirst, but we're told that he says that specifically, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So keep your hand right here and go back to Psalm chapter 69. The scripture that's being fulfilled is the 69th Psalm. Uh, in Psalm chapter 69, as, as many of the Psalms are, are a prophetic Psalm about, about what Jesus Christ is going to do. Uh, last week we looked a lot at the 22nd Psalm, where he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He goes on and through all that's going on there on the cross. Um, today, it's Psalm 69 <clears throat> that's being fulfilled. Um, uh, Psalm chapter 69, verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are coming in unto my soul. I sink in deep fire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. So he's, he's at that time when God has abandoned him, as it were, that time when God has, has broken his relationship with him. Um, he's weary of his crying. His throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Indication there, my throat is dry. But if your throat is dry, what would you do? I thirst. What? I thirst. thirst. You would get a drink. If your throat is dry, then you drink. We'll see that as we go on here. So, but that gives you an indication what this prophetic psalm is leading up to. Verse 4 They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully are mighty, then I restore that which I took not away. So they that hate me without a cause are more than the heirs of my head. They that would destroy me, being my my enemies wrongfully. Did those people that crucified Christ have any reason to hate him and be his enemies? Yeah. No, they're his enemies wrongfully. And they hate him without a cause. He ran here in the 69th Psalm, go to John chapter 15. The idea of uh, they hated him without a cause is important. Because that hate without a cause is what condemns them. 
is what makes the crucifixion of Christ um, it, uh, improper, if you will, illegal, because there's no cause for that. In John chapter 15, verse 24, it says this, If I have not done among them the works which none other man did, they have not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. That, but this comes to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So it's, it's prophesied, we just read it, Psalm chapter 69, they that hate me without a cause. And Jesus Christ in John chapter 15, as he approaches the end of his ministry, he says, you know, if I hadn't come and done all these wonderful works, if I hadn't preached to them the gospel of the kingdom, then they might have a cause to hate me, but I've done all these things. I've done these wonderful works. I've shown them these wonderful things. They have no reason to hate me, and yet without a cause, they hate me. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5, uh, earlier in his ministry, as his ministry is beginning, when it, it was you know, the Sermon on the Mount, is how we call the Sermon on the Mount, he says this about hating without a cause. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 21. He had heard that it was said by that of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rabbi, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Notice verse 22. I say to you, so, so you've heard it said by that whole time, Thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of judgment. So, so, so that the new standard of the law is not just that you kill someone, but if you're angry with him without a cause. So they get Jesus Christ in, in John 15 and he said, they hated me, what? Without a cause. So, so they have been condemned in that they hate their brother because this is the Jews that hate him. They hate their brother, a Jew, Jesus Christ, without a cause. No reason for it. They hate him without a cause. He hadn't committed a crime. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't broken their law. He hadn't done any of those things. And yet they hated him without a cause. So if you go back to uh, Psalm now, chapter 69, as you so so this whole this whole psalm is leading up to uh, Jesus Christ being he's hated without a cause. They're going to crucify him without a cause. That when you, and, and, and he's thirsty, my throat is dry. And when you get down to verse 20 of John chapter 69, um, he says this, John, John 20, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 20, uh, did I say John 69? Wow. That's not right. John 69 is not a true John. Uh, Psalm 69 down to verse 20, reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. So you see, um, he's, he's recounting here what he's going through, but very much like Psalm 22, where he recounts what's happening on the cross. He says, Reproach and broken my heart, I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, there was none. For comforters, but I found none. He's totally and completely alone. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then in verse 21, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which would have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. That which would have been for their welfare, that is, this is something that would have been good for them. Messiah came, Messiah preached to them the gospel, Messiah did miracles and signs and wonders. That thing that would have been good for them, for their welfare, let it become a trap. Because they, they, they had an opportunity and they failed. But in the middle of that passage, verse 21, in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And so if you go back, of course, to the passage in John 19 that we started with, the fulfillment of that prophecy is in John chapter 19, uh, verse number 28. 
when he says, I thirst, in, in verse 28, verse 29, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said it is finished, we'll get to that one in just a moment. But he is, he does that as a purposeful act to fulfill prophecy. In my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And to read it now, earlier on, you see they had been giving him vinegar earlier on in the, in the, in the uh, account of what happened. And so at this last moment, when he suffered all those things that Psalm 69 says, when, when he's alone and when he suffered, you know, there was no comfort, there was no one to help me. But he knows that there's something that has to be done. There's something that has to be fulfilled. And the thing that has to be fulfilled is they have to give me vinegar to drink. So if he's on the cross, how's he going to get them to give him vinegar to drink? He's going to say, I thirst. And when he says, I thirst, they give him vinegar to drink. And the verse says that, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saying, I thirst. And what scripture is that? Well, that's Psalm chapter 69, where he said, my mouth is dry. And then my thirst are going to give you vinegar to drink. So how does he bring those two together? He says, I thirst. And the scripture is fulfilled. One of the things that illustrates to us as we've been talking about through this whole, this whole series of studies is that Jesus Christ is not on the cross just mindlessly battling like we might be. If we were in that, that, that much suffering and that much agony and that much pain, who knows what we would say? Just, you know, we'd just be burned out or whatever. Jesus Christ was not that way. Jesus Christ is making thinking, rational, reasoned statements. He's telling Israel what they have to do. He's crying out to the Father when he's forsaken. He is now thinking, I've got to. Here's a prophecy that's not fulfilled. And imagine if you've been through six hours of what Jesus Christ has been through to remember Psalm 69, verse 21. We got to do that one yet. I mean, that's it's amazing and incredible that in his humanity and all that he's going through, he can remember Psalm 69, 21. That prophecy has not been fulfilled. And that the scripture might be fulfilled, I will say, I thirst. And in my thirst, they will give me vinegar to drink. And that's exactly what happens. And Jesus Christ on the cross um, fulfills prophecy. But there's an even bigger meaning to that and he's thirsty they give him vinegar anybody in here we come in a hot summer day and you're thirsty anybody go get a bottle of vinegar to drink my sister used to drink vinegar straight vinegar Ooh. yeah but anyhow um that's not what you get obviously they're doing that to mock him you know i thirst what he wants is cool water what they give him is vinegar but go with me back to um luke chapter 16. Well, so get Luke 16 and get Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 16. Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 16. The bigger spiritual picture here is that Jesus Christ has just come out of this time when he was uh, separated from the Father. He's come out of this time where he is, is made to be sin for us. He's just come out of this time where he has suffered the wrath of God poured out without a mixture from the power of the nation. Literally, he has suffered the second death. Literally, he has suffered the torments of hell in that time when he's made these sin. So there's a, if you look at Matthew chapter 5, one of the old Beatitudes says uh, in verse, uh, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they which you hunger and thirst after righteousness. So if he has just been made to be sin for us, then what was he made to be? Righteousness or unrighteousness? Unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. So if he's just coming out of that time when he was made to be sin, and when he was made unrighteousness on our behalf, then what is he going to thirst for? Righteousness. Righteousness. He's going to thirst for that that he had with the Father before the world began. Glorify me with the glory which I had in thee before the world began. That's his prayer. So as he comes out of that time of being made 
make me sin, and he says, I thirst, yet yeah, it's, it's to fulfill that prophecy, and so he gets to drink the vinegar, but it's also him saying, I, I, I want to restore that that I had with the Father before the world began. I want that righteousness back. I hunger and thirst to be back united with my Father in perfect righteousness. If you look at Luke chapter 16, um, this is the account of the rich man Lazarus, of course, down in verse 19 of Luke 16. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and white linen, and for his sons was he every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of swords. And Simon he fed with the chunks which fell from the rich man's table, or with the dogs came and laid his swords. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was buried by the angels of Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So as that man who suffers in hell, well, what, does he, what does he want? Why? Just, just, just one problem. Just Lazarus, if you dip his tongue in water and then and put him on my tongue because I'm tormented in this plane. And again, that's what Jesus Christ is coming out of. He's coming out of all that, the suffering, the second death, and suffering the, the, the torment of God's wrath. And he said, I thirst. So it's a physical thing, but it's also a spiritual thing. Physically, he's thirsty. You know, my mouth is dry. But also spiritually, he's hungry and thirsting to have restored that position that he had with the Father. To have restored that relationship with the Father. To have restored all that he gave up when he was made to be sin for us. So back up to John chapter 19 and verse 30. And this is uh, the second choice of his statement. John chapter 19 and verse 30. And this is maybe one of the most famous uh, verse 30, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When he received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. So what's finished? Well, it's not all the prophecy, obviously, that's finished, because there's a lot of prophecy yet to be fulfilled. But his work is finished. The work that the Father gave him to do. Uh, keep your hand, uh, I can't run, I'm going back to Luke when we come back. Go to... Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. When he says it is finished, he's saying that the sacrifice for sin has been made. Speaking of being thirsty. The sacrifice for sin has been made. And I need more to a little problem on my tongue. So. Uh, the sacrifice for sin has been made. The, the plan of God to provide redemption and forgiveness and eternal life and righteousness. That plan and this part of that plan is finished. Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way, beginning in verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stand the daily ministry and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool, for by the one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 12 says, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down. It is finished. There is only one sacrifice for sins forever. And then I'm going to sit down because it's finished. And when he makes that statement, it is finished, he said that the work that I came to do, the sacrifice for sin, the being a substitute for sinners, the being made to be sin, that work is finished. It's done. If you go to Romans chapter 3, Paul talks about it too, uh, in his epistles, because of course it's it's the nation Israel in Hebrews that is being told, this is the final work, this is the final sacrifice. And it's the Gentiles and Romans that Paul is telling, this is the final work, this is the final sacrifice. 
Romans 3, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God has set Him forth to be a propitiation. He is the satisfaction for sin. And when Jesus Christ in John chapter 19 says, It is finished. He's saying that, that sacrifice for sin, that work that I needed to do to solve the sin problem, is done. And I'm going to sit down now at the right hand of the Father because my work is done. I have accomplished what He sent me to do. So it is finished is an important statement, obviously. You know, it's probably the most well-known after my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And then it is finished. Uh, and then the last thing, if you go back to the book of Luke, chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And, and in Luke 23, he joined you again. So, so I thirst, it is finished. I thirst to have that relationship restored. I thirst to have that righteousness that I had with my father before the world began. And in Luke chapter 23, as he addresses him again in verse number 46, after all this has happened, um, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, uh, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. Father. So that, that that he wanted restored is restored. Father, into thy hands. I can, Father, forgive them. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He, that relationship now is restored. That righteousness that he thirsted for has been restored. That that communion and that fellowship with the Father has been restored. And he again can refer to him not just as God, but he's my Father. And Father, I, I trust you. I commend my spirit into your hands. You take my spirit. I'm going to release my spirit now. And that's another fulfillment of prophecy. Um, go back and keep your hand here in Luke. Um, get it. Should have to keep John 19, John chapter 19. That's where we saw the first two statements today. John chapter 19. But go back to Psalm chapter 22, because in what he did, he dismisses his spirit. So we need to understand first of all that, that it was completely voluntary. No one, no one, you know, took his life. He laid it down. So. What is the significance of when he did that? Well, in Psalm chapter 22, uh, we talked about this last week, this prophecy is fulfilled in verse uh, 17. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. So one of the prophecies in Psalm chapter 22 is, I may tell all my bones, yet no broken bones. But we know, though, that in John 19, verse number 30, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first, and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break on his legs. So if they had come and Jesus Christ had been dead all they had not been dead already, what would they have done? They would have broken his legs. If they broke his legs, would Psalm 22, 17 be true? No. It would not. So Jesus Christ knows what time it is. He knows what's happening. He knows. You know, they're talking here around the cross. They're, hey, we gotta get these guys off the cross. Hey, tomorrow for Sabbath day, you know, we gotta we got to be sure to keep that Sabbath. Even though we just crucified the Lord of glory, we wouldn't want to miss the Sabbath day tomorrow. It's so stupid. It is so ridiculous. We wouldn't want to miss the Sabbath day, even though we just killed Jesus Christ. 
So, so Jesus Christ, Psalm chapter 22, verse 17, they're going to come break our ways. Psalm 22, 17 says, I may come on my bones. They didn't break my bones. So I need to, I need to do something here. I need to dismiss my spirit. And he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And when they came to break his legs, he said, oh, right. See that timing. When is he going to dismiss his spirit? At what moment is he going to die? Because remember, go to, go to John chapter 10, since you're there in John. John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 17. John chapter 10 and verse 17. Therefore, that my Father loved me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. I lay down my life, that I might take it again. I lay down my life. I dismiss my spirit. I say when. And the when that he said was so that his spirit was dismissed, so when they came to break the legs of those on the, that they were crucifying, it didn't break his legs. And Psalm 22, 17 is fulfilled. It, it, it just, you can't emphasize it enough. Jesus Christ is walking by faith in the Father's life. I know the scripture says they're going to give me vinegar to drink. I know the scripture says none of my bones will be broken. How can I fulfill that purpose of God? How can I bring that prophecy to pass? How can I make sure that not a bone is broken in me? Well, they're coming to great legs. So I say, Father, take my spirit. It's done. And he actually quotes, go back to the thirty verse of Psalm. Psalm chapter 31. Psalm chapter 31 and verse 1. He actually quotes again from the Psalms uh, in Psalm chapter 31. I think Jesus Christ was pretty familiar with the Psalms, it seems like. This. He's quoted them a lot there uh, in those final moments. Psalm 31, verse 1. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thy ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock or a house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid early for me. For thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou shalt redeem me, O Lord, God of truth. And this is a, a prayer that, that Jesus Christ is making after that time of darkness. After the Father has forsaken him, after the work is finished, now he says, Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me. I, I, was, I was in the pit. I was suffering the wrath of God. But thou hast redeemed me out of that, and you're going to raise me up to sit at your right hand. So all, all through that experience on the cross, Jesus Christ is following the prophets, following the psalmists. He said, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. Father, it's done. In the thy hand I my spirit. And so what we know about looking at those statements that Jesus Christ makes on the cross, again you if you just superficially look at them like the one about his mother and John and all that, it's just well he's just talking about what's going on that day. But behind those things, behind what he's saying spiritually, there's great truth in what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. There's great uh, information and instruction as he pulls from the Old Testament, Psalm chapter uh, 31, Psalm chapter 22, Psalm chapter 69, and, and those standing there that day, here's the thing, if they had ears to hear, remember at the beginning of his ministry he said, whoso have ears to hear, let him hear. And those standing there that day, if they had ears to hear, they would know. What did the centurion say? Truly, truly, this was a righteous man. Truly he was. And anybody standing there that knows the Old Testament Scripture, but there's two groups. There's those that believe he was who he said he was, and they're hearing the Scriptures, and they're saying, yes, 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 yes. And then there's those scribes and those Pharisees and those chief priests standing there listening to that and saying, well, it doesn't make any sense to us. It doesn't make any sense to us. We just can't see it. 
because they did not have ears to hear. We need to have ears to hear what the scripture said. Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be, he is who he claimed to be. And that death on the cross is, is the thing that separates us from eternity in hell. What he accomplished there on the cross and what he's teaching us in those seven saves is the means whereby we can have eternal life and we can receive the gift. He was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that death on the cross is the only thing, the only hope that any of us have had for eternal life. That's why our hearts not worth prayer. God and Father, again, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the, the, the amazing work that he did there at Calvary. We thank you that he could say it is finished and we can know there's not one other thing that has to be done for us to have eternal life. It's all been done. It's all been accomplished. We simply need to believe it and trust that that work that was done is applied to us. We thank you for the, the, the marvelous gift of resurrection. We thank you for all that we have in Christ. We thank you for the time we spent here this morning, the time we spent in this place over the years. Uh, and pray that as we go on and continue with the work of the ministry, that truly we will keep it focused on Jesus Christ and on the cross where He paid for our sins. For some Jesus' name we pray. Amen.